2017 is finally fucking over. I think in general we can all kind of agree 2017 was kind of a bit of a dumpster fire of a year. And I did joke in my review of the Templars that this was my year of the reading slump. I didn't read a lot. I went through long periods where I didn't really read anything new or it took me forever to read a book or I read things I really didn't want to say anything about because I had nothing to really say about them. And I think that's not entirely fair to my reading year. Sure, there are a lot of times where I didn't really read anything, but it wasn't necessarily something that made me unhappy. I don't like using the word reading slump. That's not even a word I used before I came to booktube. I think it really implies that like you should be reading all the time. What is wrong with you? Why aren't you reading? No, I wasn't reading because I was going to the movies, I was watching good TV, I was skating, I was lifting, I was seeing friends and family and traveling and doing all sorts of crazy things. It's not like my life was empty. So while it may have been a bit of a dumpster fire year, I actually think my reading year was fairly decent. So let's wrap it up. In 2017, I read a grand total of 78 books with an average-ish star rating of around 3.9. Now this is according to what Goodreads told me, and because Goodreads doesn't do quarter, half, or three quarter stars, yeah, probably around 3.8, 3.9 is, sounds about right for an average. That's actually not that bad. I think it's pretty solid. And what I liked was this year when I, when I went through my year in books or whatever on Goodreads, I actually remembered the majority of the books that I read. There were a handful on there that I go, shit, I read that this year? Good God, I don't even remember it. But for the most part, I remembered them. For good or for bad. I normally always list what were my favorite and least favorite books of the year. And I'm going to do that, obviously. But I'm also adding another character, which is my most meh books of the year. Books I didn't love, but books I didn't hate, but I just want to mention because they were so wholly like meh. Or they were books in which I'm very torn on them, in which there are good things or things that I like and things that I really don't. So they have to sit in this weird middle ground. In the case of all of these lists, the only way they are ranked is the order in which I read them. So we're going all the way back to January and then making our way to December. But let's start with the worst, shall we? First book that I read this year and really didn't like was Frostblood by Ellie Blake. This was a book I received as an arc from the publisher on NetGalley, and I'll be honest, I didn't go into this book with very high expectations. It sounded so... like I've read this a billion times. But I have found that sometimes I read a synopsis that sounds like something I've read before, see after I'm rising, and end up loving it. So oftentimes I will give books the benefit of the doubt and I was like, why not, let's go into it. I hated this book. And I did find it interesting that this book is sort of all about as many uh, YA fantasies or dystopians like this where you have like a good group of people and a bad group of people based on something they're born with. In this case, it's like, are they firebloods or are they frostbloods? Essentially the message of these stories is usually that like, your inherent prejudices of who is better is like bullshit and you need to throw it away. There's this scene where our protagonist uh, is a fireblood. I guess the frostbloods are in charge. I don't know. I honestly don't remember this book at all. Main character burns this other character we're clearly supposed to like and he responds with this unreserved anger like, whoa, he loses his shit. And obviously it's because of trauma and prejudice and all that. And it's like, okay, great moment. Here's your theme. We don't do anything with it. I also didn't like it because it plays with the idea of like the religion and mythology of the world involves the four winds, north, east, south, and west. And the mythology is so inconsistent. Like the north is represented by force, which is the Norse god of the north wind. The south is just sud, which is the French word for south. The west is by cirrus, which has nothing to do with mythology. It's just a type of cloud. And the east wind is called Eurus, which is the Greek name for the east wind. And I just went, what, what are we doing with this mythology? I don't think the author knows. And it never really comes into play in this book. And I was like, why did we bother? I did not like this book, guys. Next one was a real disappointment for me. It was The Bedlam Stacks by Natasha Pulley, another arc I got from NetGalley. Now, to be fair, I was excited for this one because I'd actually read, also as an arc on NetGalley, The Watchmaker of Filigree Street by Natasha Pulley. And that was this really fun kind of Victorian mystery that had a great friendship. And I was like excited for her next book. And this book sounded like it was gonna have shades of kind of Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad and some cool like, ooh, maybe we're just gonna go fucking crazy in the jungle kind of thing. And I was like, I'm here for it. I'm here for that shit. I know Heart of Darkness is very hit or miss with people. I haven't really quite like it. Maybe it's because I'm all about people descending into total madness. So I was like, I'm here for it. 
And I also love the fact that this book was pitched as having a lot of magical realism. And the part that frustrated me was that, yes, Polly is a very talented writer. And she's clearly good at magical realism, kind of, whatever's going on in this book. But the problem is that this book is way too long because it doesn't really do much. It sort of has one thing that it does and then it just repeats for like 350 pages. And also the ending sucked. It just sort of fizzled out. It was this, it, the ending was so boring and I didn't like it. The next one is no real surprise, I'm sure, because I, I did a review on it and I opened the review by swigging scotch. Uh, the Traitor's Kiss by Aaron Beatty, Beatty. Don't know the author's name, don't know how to say it. Frankly, don't care. Really hated this book. Oh God, guys. At first I wasn't interested in the book, then I slightly was and I started it and hated the protagonist within like 10 pages. Oh, I'm sorry, the I'm not like undergirls. Oh my God, you have like a D cup and wear lipstick. Fuck you, you're vapid. It's like, what the hell kind of protagonist is this? I just hated her so much, and the fact that the story was boring and nothing really happened was also equally frustrating. And the writing style, she wrote fucking jump cuts in this story, and it was so baffling to me that I just kind of hate read the book by the end of it, and when I finished it, I couldn't have been happier. Ugh, just thinking about this book makes me angry. Speaking of books I read that just thinking about it makes me angry. Let's talk about the book that made me so angry when I read it. I actually wanted to cry and vomit. That is On Chesil Beach by Ian McEwan. So, Ian McEwan. I actually like him as a writer. I've read a handful of his books. In general, I've liked them. I think he's a very talented writer. I don't think he truly understands asexuality. The reason I read this book was it was recommended to me as having an ace female protagonist um, along with a male protagonist. The basic premise of this book is it's a newly married couple. They're basically on their honeymoon, it's their wedding night, whatever. It takes place over the course of essentially a day with a lot of flashbacks and then a flash forward at the end. And you see essentially how this just married couple completely falls apart. She's ace, he's not, they don't really connect. My problem is, is that the female protagonist is not just ace. Fairly certain she is. The reason I say fairly certain is because she's also a victim of sexual trauma. It is very heavily implied in the book that she was sexually abused by her father. And her reactions to sex in this book are so visceral and so violently negative that I went, that is not asexuality. That is PTSD. That is a trauma response. Feeling like she's going to vomit the way she describes things, I went, no. And I don't have a problem with an ace character also being a victim of sexual trauma. That is not unknown in any way. My problem is that the way that Ian McEwan writes it, and whether or not he intended it to, this is how it came across. There's a very sinister implication that she is asexual because she was traumatized. As if to say, asexuality is not valid, it's just a result of trauma. I am so angry just even thinking of that concept. So fucking angry. I, oh my God, I hated this book. It is under 200 pages. I think it's like 120. And when I told the person who recommended it to me how angry I was when I finished it, she was like, oh, but you know, the woman goes off and lives like this great full life and the husband is like left with nothing. And I was like, I don't care because that two pages does not justify the like 120 I had to read before it. Not only that, we're hearing about this from the husband's perspective. Why am I not getting it from the woman's perspective? I don't need the husband's perspective on how he was a shit. Yeah, I got that. I want her perspective. Except by this point, I don't want either perspective because I'm so angry at this book for daring to insinuate such a thing. Again, whether or not it was intentional, that's how it came across. And that is such a sinister and harmful insinuation. I'm getting very angry. I'm going to stop talking about this book. I hate it. Tower of Dawn by Sarah J Mass. Kind of like I said in my review, I hate everything. I hate almost everything about this series by this point. I don't know why I fucking torture myself by reading it still. I hate everything. I did a review on it. It was salty as fuck. Ugh. It's for the most meh books. Again, these are books that I'm kind of torn on, or I just, ugh, they're just like awkwardly in the middle. They're the awkward children, I don't know. Roseblood by A.G. Howard. I was interested in this book because it was being pitched as a kind of Phantom of the Opera retelling, and I love the Phantom of the Opera. 
I love the musical. I do like the 04 movie, despite all of its many problems, don't at me, I know it's got problems, trust me. And I've also read the original novel by Gaston LaRue, as well as a handful of other kind of like spin-off novels, uh, one of my favorites being Phantom by Su Susan K. Suzanne K. I think that's it. But I was kind of excited for this. Now, A.G. Howard is known for her Splintered series, and I really didn't love Splintered. I think I read the first two books, and the issue being it's Alice in Wonderland, and I don't really like Alice in Wonderland. It doesn't float my boat, so I was never really gonna like those books. But I was curious about Roseblood. And the thing about Roseblood is it does have some interesting aspects to it. And these are things that frankly come out of Phantom of the Opera, things you wanna do with the idea of say like succubi elements, vampiric elements, there's Hades and Persephone elements, Beauty of the Beast elements. There's all these amazing things you can pull from in Phantom of the Opera, like no matter which version you decide to pull from. And again, some of the mythos of the world of Roseblood was really interesting, but ultimately the story wasn't great. <laughs> uh, the characters were annoying as fuck. Except for like one, t two side characters who were kind of fun. And I was like, oh, you're cute and adorable. And the reason I think you're cute and adorable is because our main character is whiny as fuck. So it's meh because there were world and lore elements I liked, but didn't really like the story, didn't really like the characters. I was bummed because I love Phantom of the Opera one day. A Court of Wings and Ruin by Sarah J. Mass. I struggle with this book. I struggle with Sarah J. Mass in general. I just, she leaves me so angry and frustrated about so many things and yet I devour her books because they are crack. They are not objectively good, but I just can't seem to stop reading them. I'm in an unhealthy, toxic relationship with her books. I swear. And the thing about Ack of War that ultimately, there were a lot of very specific things that disappointed me, but if I were to sort of try and bunch it all up and tie it with a bow, the overarching issue is that I think she sort of peaked in that series with Akamath. I think that A Court of Mist and Fury was actually, for her, so well done. Borderline almost a good book in many ways. And Akawar was just such a weird disappointment. It was like you didn't live up to anything that was done in Akamath. I think she actually did so much in Akamath that Akawar ended up just having nothing to do. And it's this really awkward book and I just, I don't like so many elements of it, and I think I dislike more elements than I actually like of it, especially if I compare it to Akamath. Like, I don't know. It just sort of sits with Akatar as being under Akamath. Like, she peaked at the second book, and the third book was just, it exists. Lord of Shadows by Cassandra Clare. This is sort of a similar thing I have with Sarah J. Mass in that there are many things I really like, but then also very many things that just tend to crop up in Cassandra Clare books that I don't like. I am way kinder to Cassandra Clare than I probably am to Sarah J. Mass. Probably just because I've been reading Cassandra Clare for longer and I just have a greater attachment to her, so there is a sort of nostalgia factor in that regard. Lord of Shadows, I mean, honestly, the entire Dark Artifice series thus far, the two books have not been my favorite. And my issue is really, I don't like the fairies. There's a, there's the, a trope that I hate that was really introduced and it's eh. There are a lot of things that I really can like sink my teeth into. This is like my crack and I'm here for it. And she writes really great endings. But there's so many things about Lord of Shadows that frustrated me. One, it did not need to be nearly as long as it was. I think the entire detour into fairy was so pointless and so useless, did not need to be in there. Like you could cut the entire section in fairy and I think you'd be okay. And so there are many things that left me just sort of eh about it. Tess of the Road by Rachel Hartman. I'm going to have a review of this, so I don't wanna say too much. I read this as an arc, it's not releasing till early next year. This is set in her Gorad universe, which she introduced with Serafina, which I absolutely love. Um, and Shadow Scale, which I had some slight issues with the ending, but still really like. It's Tess of the Road, I'm kind of torn on because there's really good elements. I think my issue was I really didn't like the main character all that much. It's actually Serafina's younger stepsister, Tess. I just wasn't as interested in her story and I found her very irritating. And while by the end there are some slightly good payoffs in a lot of ways, I just ultimately was just sort of left underwhelmed by this book, which was disappointing especially to me because I loved Serafina so much and I love the universe of Gorad and I do think there's so many good things done in this book, but I'm just sort of like Neh, on it. And finally, there's Someone Inside Your House by Stephanie Perkins. I was very curious about this book because Stephanie Perkins, obviously known for her contemporaries, her romances, and here she's doing basically a slasher flick as a book. You know what you're gonna get out of these books. And I found it just kind of interesting to see her hard write into a different genre except she didn't really entirely. There's a romance that is through the book and honestly, the romance was actually kind of fun to read. And some of the slasher elements were kind of fun to read too. 
I think the issue for me was that the culprit was identified too quickly, and so the ending was a mess. And because the ending was such a mess, I was just sort of left meh on the book. Like I was actually enjoying it. I don't love slasher flicks, but I was having a lot of fun with this book. It's like totally violent and bonkers in like sort of the best weirdly entertaining ways until it's revealed who's doing it. There's no real good explanation as to why. I mean, she sort of does by the end, but I wasn't really buying it all that much. And so the ending, the entire third act was a huge mess. Now we get to the fun ones. The fun ones are great. A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness, based on an idea by Siobhan Dowd. I listened to this actually when we got hit with a ton of snow and I couldn't go anywhere. I was ugly crying at this book. Jason Isaac narrates the audiobook and he's fantastic. And I ugly cried at this book. It was such a catharsis for tons of emotion, especially anger, but like anger that's understandable. And it's, just, oh guys, it is so good. Winter Song by S.J. Jones. Did a full review on this and basically comes down to it. I went in with like no expectations of this book. None, uh, a very shallow ones. I was like, oh, I can just, you know, project David Bowie onto a sexy Goblin King and like, that'll be it. And I ended up really enjoying the story. Again, it's not perfect. There's plenty of flaws with the story, but it's this like deep, angsty romance that I was so into. It's one of the few stories that takes an abstract concept, say music, and makes it a main character in a way and did it really well. And I loved just the writing style. I thought the writing itself was very beautiful. I can tell it was slightly called for a YA audience. I'm fairly certain there were some scenes that were probably more graphic, but it's still very deep and emotional. And I just really hooked into it and I just fell in love with the book. Oh, Winter Sound was just so good. Volumes one to five of Orange. I loved this manga series. It is beautiful. I actually read it after I'd watched the anime and it was still broke me down to tears. It's so emotional and just, hard to read at times and just written so well. I mean, the art is also great, but it's just, it's written so well. And I have like all the emotions about it and it's just beautiful. I mean, even if you don't think you're gonna be into manga, I just recommend it, it's so good. The Sons of Aries, volumes one to six. The graphic novel sort of prequel to Red Rising was by Pierce Brown, uh, was work by Eli Powell and Rick Hoskin. Really great art. Great story. It was on a character I really wanted to know more about, so that was super exciting for me, and it just like ripped my heart out. <laughs> Crushed it. Lit it on fire, stomped on the ashes. This is what he likes to do. Pierce Brown just likes to toy with my emotions. The Princess Diarist by Carrie Fisher. I read two books by Carrie Fisher this year, Wishful Drinking and The Princess Diarist, and I really enjoyed The Princess Diarist. It just made me all the more sad that we lost her talent because not only was she a great actress, she was also known for being an amazing script doctor and a writer. And it just shows in the diary entries and you really can just, the inner workings of her mind were such an interesting place and she was a phenomenal writer and it's just, ugh. La Belle Sauvage, which I probably mispronounced. It's the first book in the Book of Dust by Philip Pullman, the new trilogy being set in his world of his dark materials. Boys and girls, did I have emotions. So many emotions. I love the His Dark Materials books. They are one of my favorite series of all time. Not even just for nostalgia value, I still reread them and just go, holy shit, I'm amazed by so many things that go on in here, holy shit. I really liked this first book. I thought it was so much fun and it was so great to step back into the world and also step in in a different perspective and one that's not necessarily Lyra or it sort of tangentially relates to Lyra, but it's before her. And so it was great to see this world that Lyra eventually comes into. And finally, The Templars, The Rise and Spectacular Fall of God's Holy Warriors by Dan Jones. I did a review on this and talked about how much I liked it. It was a history book. It kind of got me back into the reading at the end of the year. It was the one book that I read and suddenly went, I have things to say. I want to talk about this book. I really enjoyed it. Like, holy crap, what a well-written history book. I mean, if you want to read or listen to, in my case, a bit of history that maybe you don't know a lot about that's told in a kind of narrative style, which makes it really easily digestible, I recommend this book. It's just an interesting little pocket of history I never really knew all that much about. And it gives a lot of great context and historical background without making it feel like he's just like dumping facts and figures on you. But here's to 2018. I have a handful of books on my TBR I'm probably gonna read and all the other new releases, especially. Thanks for watching me ramble today. 
If you'd like to see more from me, go ahead and click that button with my face on it. It'll take you to my channel, where I ramble about a whole lot of different things. Got some thoughts of your own? Go ahead and leave them down in the comments. And make sure that if you want to see more ramblings from me, you click that little subscribe button. That's it for me today, you guys, so until next time, cheers.